Hi, it's Bumble. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, we're back to talking about Raggedy Ann, specifically the musical. Let me explain with that, because there's... Like, Raggedy Ann originally started, um... As, like, these books in, like, the 20s. And then there was, uh, animated movie that was made. That's basically a musical. It's called Raggedy Ann and Andy, a musical adventure. I wanted to talk about that one first because it's a lot lighter and softer, I'd say, both with, like, the characters and its themes. It's, like, you can clearly tell, like, oh, this is a children's movie, but it has such good animation and everything that I would wanted to talk about it. And then, in the 80s, they made, like, an actual musical, like, on stage and everything. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This is actually, like, one of the posters for it. I was almost going to use the Playbill picture, but I like this one better because this is, you know, what the actors and the costumes look like, pretty much. So that way you get a good sense of, like, some of the characters I talk about and whatnot and, like, sort of what it looks like. I just can't take the font and, like, the way they wrote Raggedy Ann up there because it looks almost exactly like what they did with the Indiana Jones movie. Actually, let me check to see if I'm right on that. Let me check. Yeah, yeah, the Indiana Jones, like, when they write Indiana Jones on the titles, it's the exact same way, like, the same, like, lettering and everything. I feel like they did that on purpose, and it's kind of funny, because, like, yes, Raggedy Ann very much is the protagonist of this musical, but I wouldn't put her on, like, the same, uh, level of, um, like, Indiana Jones as, like, the same type of protagonist, so... That's just funny to me. Yeah, that's, you could see, like, okay, sort of have at least some visual for this musical. Anyway, the musical is officially called, um, as you could see, Raggedy Ann, The Musical Adventure. But I don't want you to get that confused with the movie, which has a very similar title. Most people refer to this musical as Rag Dolly. So that's just what I'm going to refer to it as for the rest of this. Anyway, it's this musical they made in the 80s, I think like 1984 or something, somewhere around there. And it's based on the original books, but it's also loosely based on the movie, too. I'd say mostly just through, like, it has, like, three of the same songs, and Raggedy Andy's personality is, like, basically the same from the musical. But, like, everything else, like, this movie has, like, sort of more of an original plot. And I wanted to talk about this one later because this musical is actually really dark. Like, you'd think looking at the poster, like, oh, okay, it's just about these toys and they go on this adventure or whatever. It's probably going to be really childish and silly. But no, there's a lot of, like, really dark stuff in this musical. Like, not even the kind of stuff, like, when I mentioned at the movie where it's like, oh, yeah, if you think about it and realize the implications when it's dark. No, no, there's straight up some stuff in here that's just like, wow, I'm not sure how they got away with that. That's the thing, because I'm pretty sure the audience for this was supposed, based on the themes and stuff, was probably supposed to be, like, older, like, teenagers or something, and, like, adults. Not like it's a super adult musical or anything, but, like, I feel like that's more what the audience is supposed to be. But, you know, because it's about Raggedy Ann, there's probably, like, more of, like, children that wanted to see it. But there's, like, a lot of stuff in here that, like, if I saw this as a kid, you know, it would have been kind of scary. So, I feel like that kind of maybe messed it up a bit with its original run. Oh, yeah, I wrote some stuff about this, too. Like, I'll get into that part later. Uh, let's see. I actually wrote a script for this, more like, I took notes, I wrote like a little scripted intro when I finished watching, and then I like had taken notes, just like I did with like, all the other musicals and stuff I've been like, making videos for. Let's see, yeah, it's a musical from the 80s, based on the books and the movie, loosely based on the movie, I mean, um, and the musical, because I'm going to give spoilers for this, so... I might as well just tell you what it's about now, and then you can decide if you want to watch it and then come back. Because uh, I'm going to spoil everything, like I always do. Anyway, it's about Raggedy Ann, uh, her brother Andy, and like all these other toys. And let's see, there's a camel, there's a panda, and a baby doll. Those are the other toys. And they're trying to take their owner, who's this little dying girl named Marcella. She's probably like 10 at most. Um, to go see this uh, quote-unquote doll doctor who might be able to cure her, and they have, like, a limited amount of time to do so. They have the span of, like, a night, 
basically to go try and get her there and go on this whole adventure and stuff. Oh, and here's something else. I was reading about, like, the books and, like, the author, which kind of made the musical even more dark for me. The reason her name's, like, Marcella and stuff is because the original author for the books had a daughter named Marcella, and she ended up getting sick somehow or something. It was always sickly. I don't remember, but the point is she died, like, when she was still a kid. And then, like, her dad started writing the books and stuff, and the Raggedy Ann character almost as, like, a way to sort of keep her alive, I guess. And that's just really sad, but then also makes some of the stuff in here, like, a little morbid when you think about it, because Marcella is a character in this who is dying. It's just like, hmm, okay. I mean, I don't know if they did that on purpose or not, probably, but... Like, the Marcella in the musical isn't, like, literally supposed to be, like, his daughter or anything. They just share the name and they're both, like, dying, but, you know, just things to think about. Anyway, I found out it was also part of this cultural exchange thing where the actors who, I'm pretty sure American, yeah, would go and perform the play in Moscow, which was even made into, like, this documentary that I think might be on YouTube. I don't know how long it is, but it's called uh, Rag Dolly in the USSR, and it talks about that, like how the actors would go to Moscow and do the play, and then there would be like actors from Moscow who do the play in the US. And it was supposed to be like really popular in Moscow, but then when the actors went to go and perform it um, in Broadway, it ended up being a huge flop for some reason. I don't know, may maybe, I'm considering maybe it's because like, you know, it's kind of hard to tell who the audience is. Like, being about Raggedy Ann would probably make kids want to see it, but then, you know, with the themes and everything, it's actually more, like, appropriate for adults, so maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know, man. Um, but anyway, yeah, it ended up being a huge flop on Broadway, and then people found out about these bootleg uh, recordings. Well, I say bootlegs, but it's more of, like, there's these demo recordings of all the songs that were on YouTube, and that got people interested in it again. And then there's this group of fans, like, lost media enthusiasts and, like, fans of Raggedy Ann in general, who formed this group called Rare, which is an acronym just for, um, Raggedy Ann Revival Effort, and they're trying to, like, preserve and revive the musical, and thanks to them that it was able to be found, um, because that's the thing, like, before the musical was found, because it was lost media for years, um, all there was was those uh, aforementioned demo recordings of the songs, and then, like, a Wikipedia article, which is actually where this poster's from. It's from Wikipedia. Um, I mean, I didn't go on Wikipedia and get it, but, you know, it was on Google Images. I saw it there and thought, yeah, it's a good way to represent it. Get, let them see the characters and stuff. Um, but yeah, the group was able to find the footage, and the footage was actually in the New York State Archives, which I thought was interesting. But maybe it makes sense, because it was part of the cultural exchange thing, so it sounds like something that probably would be archived now. The thing is, there's like multiple productions of this or something, and only one full recording of one of those productions is... That's all we have so far. We don't know what's up with the other productions. The thing is, there's a part early on in the musical where I guess there wasn't parts, there was a part, like, that wasn't recorded with the production we're watching, um, cause then it cuts to a picture of the playbill, and I'll mention that later, and then it cuts to a different production. It was hard to tell at first because, uh, the person who plays Raggedy Ann, her name's, um, Ivy Austin, played Raggedy Ann in, like, pretty much every production. But I noticed, like, oh, this little girl who's playing Marcella isn't the same one from, like, a few minutes ago, because she had, like, a different hairstyle and everything. It's kind of a little disappointing that it's, like, that's where the footage is gone, because it's supposed to be the part where Raggedy Ann first comes to life. But then the rest of the footage is from, like, the same, um, like, production, so it's fine, but... I just thought, oh, that's interesting. But I'll mention more about that later. Okay, and then literally everything else I have is six pages of notes I took. So yeah, everything from here on is going to be like spoilers and my reactions and stuff. Bye.
vacation, you know the drill. Actually, wait, no. I don't know when this is being posted. Because I recorded um, talking about the Portal 2 musical first, and I recorded it in like a similar way. So you might not know the drill, but like, yeah, I'm going to spoil everything from here on out. So, yeah, things will probably be very confusing because I don't have visuals or anything. Uh, okay, so, but I, like, I wrote, like, what's happening and stuff, too. Alright, so, the footage starts with, like, the play hasn't even started yet. It's like, you know, when you go to a musical and everyone's, like, starting to sit in their seats, and then they usually have, like, a picture of something that's related to the musical before, like, it actually starts. Like, when you go see Wicked, they have this giant map on, like, the screen. That's just like a map of Oz. So for this one, all they have is this dark stage and a Raggedy Ann doll that's sitting and facing towards the audience and there's a spotlight on it and that's it. So seeing that reminded me of, um, there's this meme I see every once in a while. It's supposed to be of like a Winnie the Pooh animatronic. I think it's either a Winnie the Pooh animatronic or it's like some something from Kingdom Hearts. I don't remember where it's dark. And there's like a Winnie the Pooh with the light on it, and it has its head down. And it just rem made me think of that meme. Actually, wait, let me, let me look that up real quick. Mm. Pooh and animatronic meme? Oh no, never mind. It is. It was not an animatronic. It's maybe it was a Kingdom Hearts cartoon. I don't know, because I've never played Kingdom Hearts. It's like this picture of Winnie the Pooh where he's sitting in a dark room and his head's down and it's not like literally Winnie the Pooh, it's like a a thing. Okay, doesn't matter. Anyway, um, the Raggedy Ann doll that they use is so cute because it isn't just a doll that's there like for the start of the show, it's a prop they use before Raggedy Ann, because Rag they're going to come to life, I already mentioned that. Yeah, before Raggedy Ann comes to life, they just have this, like, Raggedy Ann doll that they use. And it and that's the one that's on the stage, and it looks so cute. Because I've seen pictures of, like, other Raggedy Ann dolls, and they look, like, a little creepy, but, no, this one's cute. Anyway, um, then there's this, the very first song. I don't really know why it's there. It doesn't really serve a point, but it's this song that's called, uh, Rabs, Buttons, and Giving Ham. And it isn't even sung by the main cast, but I think it's good anyway. It's like, I noticed there's these specific, um, what I call them? Extra? No, no, because they don't appear in other scenes. No, there's specific actors for these characters. They don't have names or anything. They just show up and they sing that song, like, every once in a while in the musical. But it's like the first thing you see, you know, once the Raggedy Ann doll's gone. Uh, and I really like their costumes, too, because... They have these, like, extra long scarves and overalls, and it's, like, kind of little, like, dorky looking almost, but, like, it fits with what they're singing about, so, I think it's neat, um. Gosh, <coughs> 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 uh, hold on, let me drink some water. Sorry about that, y'all. these. Anyway, then I noticed that there's subtitles for this, which I'm really glad because not every musical that I've, that's like officially on YouTube that I've watched has subtitles, because then when there's subtitles you don't miss any lines. But they even have the song names listed before the songs start, like with the Rags and Gingham thing, there was a subtitle that just said song, and then the title of the song, and then the song started with the lyrics, and that was nice. I liked that. It's like, Thanks to whoever put the subtitles for this musical. Very cool. Um, anyway, and then the musical, like, starts, starts, and it's, it starts in Marcella's house. She's the little girl I mentioned, and she's sitting in her bed, and her dad's there, and there's these, like, three doctors that are there. And I found it funny that they're all just kind of quacks, basically, and they don't know how to do their job, like, they keep arguing and changing their mind about, like, what's wrong with her, like, stuff about her temperature and whatever. And then they sing this song, 
um, diagnosis. It's really catchy and I forgot how good it is, especially because it kind of reminds me of like old timey musical numbers, especially with the music. Actually, a lot of the songs in this kind of remind me of that, which is great, honestly. And then, like, as a visual way to show that they're supposed to be jokes and not know what they're doing, is they put on these, like, clown head things. Not like masks, but like, you know when you'll, like, look at a costume shop and there'll be, like, a bald cap with, like, curly clown hair on the ends or something? That's what they put on to show how they're all jokes, and it's like... Bruh, with this song and like, what a great start to a musical about a rag doll with these doctors telling this dad and this like little 10 year old girl how sick she is and that she's gonna die. Like I'm not kidding, there's a, like one of the lines literally just says, um, and you're sick, 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 and we think you're gonna die and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Like, Raggedy Ann hasn't even shown up yet, and this is already getting, like, not the direction you'd expect. Like, I knew it was coming, it's just, I haven't seen this musical in, like, a year or so. Um, like, I watched it as soon as I found out that the footage was found, and then I haven't watched it since until the day I'm recording this, early October, actually. So, um, like, I vaguely remembered some stuff, but not like certain lines and things but yeah it's kind of like morbidly funny to me um that like the very first like song once the musical actually starts is just these doctors telling this little girl she's gonna die and then they finish and the dad like shoes them all out and then there's like some parts where her her and her dad are talking and the fact that you could tell, like, he really does love her is sweet, and then he even gives her the Raggedy Ann doll and everything as, like, a way to comfort her. Because, like, they mention it a little with the dad. Like, Marcel mentioned every once in a while during the musical of, like, how her dad doesn't really do anything, and he drinks a lot, and how other people think he's a failure. But he really does care about her, and you can see that, and it's very sweet, actually, because she doesn't have a mom. We'll get into that later in the musical. There's, like, a whole thing about her mom, but, um, she just has her dad, and that's it. And even though it's, like, he's not always there for her, you know that he cares and stuff. That's, that's nice, honestly. So, yeah, he gives her a in hand. And I forgot that the dad ha actually has his own song, and it's called Carry On. Uh, and I think it's sweet, honestly, I like it. It's a very simple song, but very sweet. And it's basically him singing how um, Raggedy Ann um, and her friends come to life whenever Marcel is asleep or something. The, obviously, that doesn't, like, happen yet, because he's just been given Raggedy Ann now. But, like, oh, this other thing, too, is he sews this heart onto Raggedy and you can actually see it in the poster, the little red thing, like, on her chest. It's this little, like, candy heart that's supposed to say, I love you, and because, um, the dad gives, uh, Raggedy Ann a heart, and Marcella loves Raggedy Ann and all the toys, that's what makes them come to life. And I think that's sweet, um, but yeah, that's the whole song, that whole song of, like, him talking about Raggedy Ann and her friends, and... He's trying to get Marcella to go to sleep. And I like how in the song, um, he even moves around the Raggedy Ann doll, the prop, like it's talking to her. And I thought that's cute. Um, but then when the song's over, Marcella's dad, it like, it cuts to black and then she has a spotlight on the dad. And he's praying to God to let Marcella survive because the doctors keep saying that she isn't going to survive the night and that she'll die soon. And that's honestly really sad, actually. Um, there's a lot of little moments like that throughout the musical, where it's like, they'll go through a song, and then something kind of depressing happens, and you're just like, oh, right, I forgot what I'm watching. Um, okay, and then, like, the dad prays, and then it cuts to black again. Like, this, it gets dark. Um, and then it cuts to a picture of the pamphlet. Pa no, not pamphlet. Playbill. Yeah, it cuts to a picture of the playbill in the video, 
because I guess they didn't have footage for the next part, but then you can still hear the music in the background. But then it cuts to one of the Russian productions with a different Marcella actress, like I mentioned. Like, the Marcella in the one that I'm watching has, like, short hair with the barrette, and then it cuts to a different, I could tell it's different, um, footage because the Marcella it shows has braids, and it's just, like, a very quick clip that's, I guess, Raggedy Ann supposedly has come to life, and she's, like, laying there in Marcella's bed, and the actor says something, or Marcella's actor says something like, oh, Raggedy Ann, and, and Raggedy Ann, I don't know what Raggedy Ann says, I think she's supposed to mimic her, but because it's one of the other productions, like, the lines translated in the subtitles in English, but Raggedy Ann set, replies to Marcella in Russian, and then it cuts back to the footage from when the musical first started. The one, then it cuts back to the footage of the production we actually have, like, the full musical for. Um, and then that footage starts again, and Raggedy Ann is just alive. Like, like nothing happens in between the two. It's just, like, Raggedy Ann's still in the same spot, still at the end of Marcella's bed. And it's, like, this whole thing of, like, Raggedy Ann comes to life, and, you know, she's alive now, so she doesn't really know anything, and she's talking to Marcella and whatever. And then I wrote this whole little paragraph about Raggedy Ann a little bit. Oh yeah, because here's the thing, um, like, as you could see with the poster and stuff, I mean, Marcella isn't in the poster, but she's, like, played by an actual child, but all the toy characters are played by adults, so it's just kind of weird seeing it's supposed to be, like, doll Raggedy Ann as an adult with, like, the size of an adult. Because, I mean, I get it's this whole thing of, like, oh, yeah, everything's just a dream, and all the dolls came to life. But I was kind of, like, I was kind of expecting when you think of, like, toys coming to life or something, kind of like with the actual movie, where the toys would be alive, kind of like Toy Story when humans weren't around. But it's not like they physically changed, it would just be them as the toys, like, moving around. But no, no, in this, they're, like, human-sized and everything, and it's, like, I got used to it after a while, but even with the costumes and the makeup, I just kind of kept forgetting that they're supposed to be toys, and they refer to themselves as toys, too, like, there's multiple times where Raggedy Ann refers to her and the other toys, and she's like, oh, but we're just dolls, so, like, it's not like they got turned into humans or anything, they're just, they're still dolls, it's just for the sake of the musical, they're, like, played by live-action people. <laughs> oh, and her personality is way different from the movie, because, like, in the movie, and, like, I'd say Didi Khan's voice acting matches with this, too, of, like, Raggedy Ann, um, like I mentioned in the other video, is, like, this very wholesome, kind doll, and she's, like, sort of braver than the other dolls, but, like, she still gets scared when she's out of her element and stuff, and, like, she's trying to rescue Babette, but she's staying cheery throughout the whole thing, and, She's just very chill and trying to help everyone she can, and how, like, Andy in the movie would say something that's rude, because he's an uh, iconic, sassy, rude character, and then Anne will be like, no, that's rude, or you're being mean, or whatever, but then the raggedy Anne in this musical, oh boy, in this one, she's more sassy and sarcastic. Like, she has a lot of, like, kind of smart-ass lines. Whether it's to Andy or, like, any of the villain characters. And she's more mature and has a lot of responsibility. And she becomes this sort of mother figure uh, for Marcella because Marcella's mom, like, you know, isn't in the picture, basically. And the whole musical, it's like she's trying to, all she cares about is Marcella and trying to, like, keep her safe and get her into the do doll doctor and everything. And I like that, honestly. I think it's, okay, even though I really like Raggedy Ann's personality in the movie and the way her voice sounds and everything, and like I said, she's one of those comfort characters to me, I feel like that specific version of Raggedy Ann wouldn't translate well 
to being in this musical because this musical has so much darker themes and more mature stuff and like adding in the whole plot to the musical about Marcella and how Raggedy Ann is supposed to be like this mother figure for her and everything. I feel like that version of Raggedy Ann wouldn't be able to fit in with all the darker of like a whole very wholesome Raggedy Ann being able to fit in with like this darker storyline that's going on basically. So I think it's for the best that Raggedy Ann and her personality is basically like her as like an adult. Like her personality I'd say, like besides being like she's still very cheerful and stuff and she'll like make jokes and she still talks in a way that sounds like Raggedy Ann. Like her voice is pretty high. Like the Raggedy Ann voice that Ivy Austin uses. Um and there's still like dialogue stuff that's like, okay, yeah, that's Raggedy Ann, but I mean She's also very sassy and stuff. She gets in the fights with her brother. And she's like the team leader and the group mom, pretty much. Like, the other toys would get distracted by things or whatever. And Raggedy Ann's like the one that keeps everybody on track and tries to get them where they need to go and stuff. And very much like the protagonist of this story. It's like, the story and like all the stuff happening all like connects back to Marcella, but. Raggedy Ann's the hero of everything, pretty much. Um, and I really like her costume, too. Like, that's part of the other reason I, like, picked this poster, because you could see it. But I feel like it doesn't really do it justice until, like, you're actually watching the musical. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I think her costume looks really good, even the wig. Because it doesn't, like, with the way the wig is, it doesn't look like it's just, like, you know, you pick up a wig and it's, like, hair. No, they made the wig in a way where it actually does look like, you know, how the doll's actual hair is, where it's, like, individual strands and everything. I think Andy's wig is the same way, too. Um, and then she has this dress that's, like, very loose and kind of baggy, which fits with how Raggedy Ann's supposed to be. Cause she's, you know, the soft, squishy little rag doll. And yeah, I love her costume a lot, because if you like go and try and look up like costumes, even if it's not just Halloween costumes for Raggedy Ann on like Google Images, it's not like the same quality or anything. It's like, here, let me just see, let me look myself. Yeah, it's like they all look really weird and basic. It's like it'll be like a white apron and then some like, like, the blue dress will only be, like, kind of loose and stuff around the arms. It's basically, like, a normal dress with an apron over it. And these costumes all just look so bad to me, basically. But then with the costume they use in the musical, it's, like, the entire dress and everything is kind of, like, very loose and baggy and very much fits the character. They even have the little thing, um, cause like with all these Raggedy Ann costumes, like her hair's still like curly and raggy, but it's like, that's it. It just looks like you put a mop on someone's head. But she has this little hairstyle and you can see it in the picture. It's the same one she has um, in the movie where she has this like little knot bow made out of hair that's on the top of her head. And I like how they even kept that detail. Yeah, her costume's really cool. I love it. Everyone's costume's really good, actually. Um, and just how puffy the dress is is great. Kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Strawberry Shortcake. But yeah, Ivy Austin uh, plays Raggedy Ann in like every production I've heard of with this musical, which I think is pretty cool because I think she's easily the best part of this entire musical. Like I've read in the comments and stuff what people like, for the musical I was watching, and everyone says how she's, like, the one that just carries this whole musical. And I'd say she really does. She just puts so much effort into playing Raggedy Ann, and it's awesome, honestly. Like, everyone else takes it seriously, too, but, like, for a musical about a rag doll and how they made Anne's personality in this, I'm so glad they, like, gave that part to somebody that tries their damn hardest with it and it shows 
And her voice is really great too, because she has this sort of voice she uses for Raggedy Ann, whether she's talking or singing and stuff, where it's like kind of high pitched. Um, like she'll sing in Raggedy Ann's voice whenever she goes on a, like a high note for something that like one of those really long high notes. It's like the voice changes to be more normal, I guess, and it sounds like really strong and pretty, and it's just kind of like this whoa change. You especially notice it on certain numbers, like, and I'll mention it later, this one called Rag Dolly, which is probably the most popular song from this. It's the song Raggedy Ann sings, and it's just like, wow, on those notes when she's not singing the Raggedy Ann voice, honestly, it just blows me away. Um, yeah, and for Raggedy Ann's voice, it's not too bad, like, she has this really high-pitched voice, but then it kind of just settles down a little bit the further along the musical goes. Okay, anyway, um, yeah, Raggedy Ann comes to life, she's with Marcella now, and Raggedy Ann just straight up says how this is a dream, because everything else in this is a dream, it's not, like, even a spoiler or anything. And then she, um, because Marcella's saying, like, Oh, yeah, I have to, the doctors told me to stay in bed because I'm sick and I'm dying, and Raggedy Ann's, like, trying to get her out of bed and whatever, and Raggedy Ann literally says, Okay, you stay here in bed and die. I have better things to do. <laughs> like, damn, okay. Like, I know she's trying to just get the kid out of bed, but, like, Marcella's even saying, like, Oh, no, I'm, I'm a good girl. I'm supposed to stay in bed, like I was told. Like, she's not doing anything wrong. Though at the same time, Marcella, and she has this attitude throughout the whole musical of just having given up hope, and, you know, it, it makes sense. I mean, all this bad stuff's happened to her with her parents, and she has these doctors that are always telling her that she's really, really sick, and that she's going to die, and that there's all these things wrong with her. And she doesn't know how she can fix it. So she's already just has this, like, kind of depressed attitude of having given up, and Raggedy Ann's always trying to, like, pump her back up and say how there's always hope, there's always something you can do. Um, okay, yeah, and then she starts talking about her brother, and there's this line I thought was kind of funny, where Ann says, um, where, uh, Marcella's like, oh, yeah, who's Andy? Because Ann starts telling some story of, like, oh, yeah, Andy got his foot under the, um, floorboards, and we had to cut it off or something. And she's like, oh, Andy's my brother. Have you ever had a brother? And Marcella tells her no. And Anne's just like, don't. <laughs> that just kind of cracked me up a little bit. Uh, like, um, the thing with the musical, wait, no, that's not what I was going to go with. Okay, so in the movie, um, Raggedy Ann and Andy had this, like, really wholesome sibling relationship where it's like, they were always there for each other. You know, I talked about it in the movie, like how Andy hated everyone except for Anne, and how they'd do anything to protect each other, and they were like this cool duo, it was very sweet. And then with the musical, <laughs> it's like, Anne gives the vibes of that meme of like, ready to sell him for a single corn chip, basically. But at the same time, it also feels realistic, and their personalities both feel realistic, too, which I think is great. Um, like, Andy has uh, the same personality he did in the movie, where it's like he tries to be very tough and stuff, and he's very sassy and sarcastic. I think he's more sarcastic in the movie, but like, in the musical, okay, I mean, it's less of him trying to be macho, like an emphasis on that, and it's more of him being like, a prankster and an adrenaline junkie, basically. Like, he straight up asks Marcella at one point if she has any cigars. Like, sir, this is a child. But, like, he spends his first few moments being alive, um, trying to find firecrackers and stuff, because he's already bored, and he's just, like, this chaotic little sh- and I love him, and Anne always has to keep an eye on him to make sure he doesn't, like, blow stuff up or whatever, and she always has to, like, nag him to do things. And, like, she'll call him dumb and stuff occasionally, too. Like, they're both, like, very sassy with each other. And you can tell that they care about each other deep down, and I think that's neat. Um, where did she go? 
going with this? Oh yeah, then I talked about their costume. It might be a little hard to tell with the poster, but um... Their designs are based, like, costume-wise, are pretty much just like the movie. The only thing is, like, since it's actual actors playing them, both the actors have their faces painted white, along with some other makeup. Like, I like how they'll have, like, the orange, like, if you look at a picture of Raggedy Ann, she has an orange nose. They have, like, an orange nose painted on their nose, and they have, like, blush on the cheeks, and maybe something with the eyelashes, too. I like that part of the makeup, but the white paint looks really creepy, especially when it's shots close up. Though I did notice that for some reason, whoever's playing Andy, the white, like, face makeup on his, him, looks, like, more creepy than Anne's, and I'm not sure why. I don't know, just my opinion there. Like, I'm gl I am glad that they have the other kind of makeup, like the nose and the blush, though, because that is kind of like a reminder and more believable of, like, oh yeah, they're still supposed to be these specific dolls, you know. Oh yeah, then there's this musical number because Anne's like physically trying to get my drag Marcella out of bed and she yells out like, oh, Andy, help me get her out of bed. And then this musical number starts called The Light, which is basically all the toys um, besides Anne, obviously, like coming out of this play box. And it's just like this introduction song and everything where they introduce themselves to Marcella and they're saying like, oh yeah, it's, we're alive now and we could do stuff and whatever. And they're trying to all get her out of bed and stuff. And I think it's really neat. Um, but like I mentioned with the toys, yeah, there's Raggedy Ann and Andy, obviously. And then there's this baby doll. The funny thing with her is like, they say stuff about her not being able to talk. Like, she'll sing in the, like, musical numbers and stuff. But then there's a, there's some point, and I'll mention it later, where she just gains the ability to talk, and then she talks in, like, an actual normal voice for the rest of the musical. But I'm so glad with this character that they didn't give her, like, some super annoying, like, baby-sounding voice, like you'd expect. Like, she'll say lines whenever she, like, before she learns how to talk, of like saying like mama or something about diapers or whatever, but it, and it's and that those parts are in like a slightly higher voice, but not in a way where it's annoying. Um, and then there's this other toy, who's this panda? And the, they portray the panda in like a very racist way. Like they have this the panda speak in broken English and. They have the panda give these, like, what's it called? Proverbs? I think, you know, when they, um, yeah, yeah, they have the panda say, like, all these proverbs and stuff. Like, I get they want to, like, Raggedy Ann introduces him and is like, oh, this is the panda, he's this wise bear. But I feel like they didn't have to do it in, like, such a racist way. I feel like if they did the musical again, which it hasn't been like done like a newer version of it yet. I think because there's like legal copyright troubles or something, but um, not copyright, but like with like who owns the rights. Anyway, um, I feel like if they made the musical again, they'd probably just have to replace the panda, which I'd be fine with because the panda's honestly my least favorite. I don't think anyone actually cares about the panda. He doesn't contribute anything to the plot either. Like even the baby doll has more of a, um, importance to the plot than the panda does, but I feel like what they could do is either just, rep if they w still want, like, another toy there, like a fourth member or whatever, they could honestly just replace the panda with a different toy and give it, like, a slightly different, like, they could still go with a, like, wise personality, but, like, not in a way where it's making fun of, like, stereotypes and stuff and just replace it with a different toy, and it would still fit the same rule and be fine. Or I feel like they could just cut the panda character altogether, because there's already a lot of, like, main characters for this. You got Raggedy Ann and Andy, you have the baby doll, you have Marcella, and then there's the camel with the wrinkled knees who joins them later. 
So outside the panda, that's already like five main characters you have to focus on and get blinds on, so... But the panda's there anyway, whatever. Um, but the baby doll's pretty cool, I, I like her. I don't think she needs to even be replaced or anything. Yeah, then the baby doll uh, starts crying or something, and it can only talk saying mama for like the beginning of the musical, and <laughs> the raggedy one's like, oh yeah, lay her down, she just needs her bottle, and they're trying to find the bottle, and they find the bottle hidden inside the birdcage, except that it doesn't have milk inside of it. It turns out, and they joked about this later, that, because I mentioned earlier how Marcella's dad drinks, he, he hid the bottle in there, um, because he put alcohol in it, he uses it to drink out of, you know, to drink, and that's why it's in the birdcage. So then Andy gives the doll the bottle, and she jokes later on about how it's a Jack Daniels, and that's when I realized, oh, they, like, the baby doesn't get drunk or anything, I just find that, like, a little funny that they accidentally gave this doll, um, alcohol. Just straight up up. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, the song Delight, um, is really good. And I like how they're just trying to get Marcel out of bed, but it's like a nice introduction song for like, not just Anne, but like, all the toys. So that's cool. Man, I'm still only on like, the second page of this, 40 minutes in, whatever. Uh, I'll go to the hour mark and then I'll stop. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, oh yeah, I mentioned about Andy being a chaotic little shit that doesn't get along with Anne. But at the same time, he does have these really nice moments, and he's just as helpful as everyone else, which is good. Like, something I noticed was during the song The Light, uh, towards the end of it, he actually carries Marcella around on his shoulders. And in general, he kind of acts like this older brother figure to her, and I think that's really cute. Like, there's parts where he'll, like, chase her around and try and scare her, or, like, just the way he talks to her gives those kind of vibes. And I think that's nice. I think that's a good thing to do with his personality. And it's a nice change and fits with the musical because, like, in the movie, I mean, he's still, like, a sassy little shit and whatever. But in that one, he had, like, this whole number with the no girls toy thing about how he hated being the girls toy and whatever. So it's nice seeing, like, with this musical, he actually gets along and cares about Marcella. And especially, which makes sense. She's a character in this now. So, in the plot's about her for them. Yeah, I think that's neat. So he's kind of like an older brother. Pest figure to her. Meanwhile, Anne's basically, like, a responsible older sister and, like, the group mom and kind of just, like, a mom figure in general to Marcella. Like, Anne's the one that's in charge of the toys and everything, having to keep an eye on them. Like, there's this scene where they have a picnic later and the toys are all, like, wandering around and she's like, come back, you guys. You should come and eat this food I worked so hard making before it gets cold, and that's like such a mom line, honestly. Um, yeah, I like that she has that role with the, t like, both the roles with the toys in this. Like, they're both very sassy, but they both have these, like, distinctive personalities and roles in this movie, er, sorry, musical. Okay, anyway, the plot starts, because, like, there's this whole thing where Marcella keeps telling people, whether it's the toys or her dad, like, oh, don't go near my closet, don't open the closet, and stuff. But then, Andy being the dork he is, when she tells him that, thinks he's just, like, hiding candy or whatever in there, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm not scared, I'm gonna open this closet. And that's how the plot starts, because opening the closet destroys the entire house and releases the villains. I'm kind of iffy with the villains in this, to be honest. Like, in most musicals, like, I'm not saying every musical villain is great, but there's always something to look forward to in, like, the villain usually has the best musical number, in my opinion, no matter what the musical is. Well, in most musicals I've seen. But here, the, mu the villain just isn't really memorable. Like, the villains in this movie are this, um... Army General, his name's General D, um, and I talk more about him later, but his pers he's like this weird animal hybrid thing, like he's, he has like this rat 
knows, I don't know what animal, I don't think he's supposed to specifically be an animal, just has like animal traits. And his personality, what I wrote, is like this typical American movie general, like how you'd imagine in those kind of movies. Um, he's also kind of racist, like he's racist whenever he talks to the panda. Like the panda's talking and he says something like, you talk United States, like what? Bruh. Anyway, and then he has these henchmen who are this bat and a wolf. And the bat has like this very high pitched voice and makes these noises sometimes like this <laughs> like I can't really do it right. Um but like that and until later on, but I'll explain that later. Uh and then the wolf is just this wolf who he has on his leash around by his neck. And they don't like I mentioned with the general he has animal like traits, but the bat and the wolf are supposed to be animals. Like actual, like an actual bat and a wolf, um, but they're pretty cool. I honestly like his henchmen um, more than I like him, and I like their costumes too. Like the wolf has this personality sort of costumes, kind of like one of those nineteen thirties movie gangsters or something. And he looks more like a werewolf than a wolf, though, with like the way the makeup is, and he has these like paws on his hand. And then the bat has this cool outfit too. I don't know how to describe it exactly. I feel like it has some like Asian influences almost with like the way her makeup is and like the way the costume is. And she has these sort of like bat wing things every once in a while. And she, I like her hair though because it's like it's black and it sticks out but then she has these little streaks of yellow. And that gets more explained later. Um, but she's really cool. She gets a musical. They both get, each get a musical number later on. I really like the bats, but I'll talk about her then later. Um, but they're cool. Yeah, so Bat, the wolf, and General D are the villains of this story. Uh, anyway, then the house is destroyed, and it's revealed that the group has until 6 a.m., um, to get to the doll hospital and everything because the general is gonna apparently take Marcelo away and kill everyone else because he wants Marcelo as his bride and that's honestly really creepy and I don't like that because the general is supposed to be an adult and Marcelo's this child so yeah that's gross um so yeah so it's basically said like how he's gonna take Marcelo away and then implied he's probably gonna kill everyone else because the whole thing is the closet door isn't supposed to be open yet, and he opened it too early or whatever, according to the general, so that's why the group still has time to live. Um, which makes me wonder that, I know it's Marcella's dream, but like, how did she even know that they were in the closet? Like, even anything bad was in the closet anyway, so, I don't know. And uh, then the girls talk to each other, and they're just left on their own. Because the house is blown up, and when the general leaves, it's like, it's like the house blew up or something, and I don't know where the house originally is, it's like some house by the river somewhere, um, like the general later refers to it as a shack by the river, but they're apparently transported to some shipyards in Miami, that's the thing, you'd think with the poster and stuff, and like, yeah, they're going to the doll doctor or whatever, that they're gonna, that it would be kind of like the movie where it's like kind of these fantasy characters and like more whimsical, but no, they're like in real locations basically, it's kind of weird, so yeah, they end up in Miami, um, in these shipyards with this fence and stuff, and that's when they meet the camel actually. Oh yeah, I don't even think the camel... I don't know if the camel's in the poster. Let me look more at this. I feel like he's supposed to be. I feel like it's sort of... Okay, yeah, yeah, by Andy's oar. Like, by the top of the oar, that, like, tannish colored thing. That's supposed to be the camel. They changed the camel's personality a bit. Um, and they also changed his design, which I'm kind of sad about. Like, the c I really like the camel design in the movie because the camel's a toy just like them, and he's blue, 
and he's really old and saggy and has these patches on him and I, lo I love the camel design in the movie but then they made his design just like this regular brown camel for some reason and because he's brown and like the way they choose to design I legitimately can't tell if the camel's supposed to be a toy like everyone else or if he's just some like actual talking camel they just found in Miami. I'm genuinely not sure. But I mean it doesn't really change anything. Oh, and the way I don't know who voices or plays the camel, uh, but his voice and the way he talks kind of reminded me of the bird from Aladdin. Do I think he's voiced by Gilbert Godfrey? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a similar vibe. That's sort of like the way the camel's dialogue is too, and I kind of like that. I'm here for that, honestly. So, like, the camel's less depressed, like, way more less depressed. Like, he still says stuff sometimes, like, when they're not sure if they're going to take the camel with him, and he, like, admits that he's probably useless or whatever. And he still actually has his song blue, but, um... Other than that, he's just pretty chill and more of, like, the comic relief a little bit. Um, oh, and then they point out, um, like, Anne reveals to the other characters, like, the reason she's so focused is because Marcella, if Marcella dies, all the toys will disappear. It's this whole thing of, like, because if she's dead, she can't love them anymore. And it's that love that's keeping them alive. Like, she loves them. And Raggedy Ann has the heart. And that's what brought them to life. So if she's dead, she obviously can't love them anymore. So it's like, they die too. Well, I don't know if they die, die. Or it's like, they just turn back into toys or something. I don't know. Hopefully they don't, like, die. Um, but anyway, that's why Ann's, like, so determined to help Marcella. And she gets frustrated with the other toys because they keep getting distracted. Like, they get distracted by the camel. She's like, guys, no, we gotta go help Marcella. And, like, the funny thing is Andy in the movie was, like, straight up ready to fight everyone. Uh, whenever anyone pissed him off. And this time, Anne's kind of the one that's ready to fight everyone if it means saving Marcella. Not like she's trying to pick fights with the other toys or anything, but, like, she's a lot more, like, aggressive and sassy and brave in this. It's kind of cool. I'm here for that, honestly. Like, there's a few times where they run into General D and instead of getting scared, Raggedy Ann straight up is just, like, ready to fight him or whatever if it means protecting Marcella. And I think that's really cool. Um, but yeah, and then it's, like, this whole thing where it's, like, you know, they're in Miami and the doll doctor's in LA. So it's, like, this group of toys and a child really have to go from Miami to LA. Like, why are they in the real world even if it's a dream? You know, like, I don't get that. Why is Marcella dreaming? Unless it's supposed to be, like, she wants, she's sick and she's lived in this house her whole life and she wants to, like, go see the world and it's like a metaphor for that and for freedom. I, I don't know exactly. I just, like, there's still whimsical elements in this. Like, there's this whole song I'll mention in a second where they try and turn their bed into a ship for them to sail on. And, like, that's pretty whimsical, along with, like, some other stuff that happens. But just the whole thing of location-wise, they're having to go to all these real places, like, on a map, just feels really off to me. But yeah, that doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, because when the house gets blown up and they end up in Miami, the only thing they have with them, with them from the house is Marcella's bed. I'm assuming that's, like, how they got to Miami or something that... Like, you know, they were all in the bed and it got blasted off or whatever. So yeah, they, they, there's this song called Mexico. Wait, let me check my ranking. Yeah, next, I made a, a little song th list thing at the end where I ranked all the songs based on my favorites. Um, Mexico's my favorite. That's, uh, that's the other thing with this too. Um, because the whole thing with the song is like, uh, they're trying to figure out how they're gonna get to LA to go see the doll doctor, and Anne's like, oh, yeah, we could, uh, turn the bed into a ship and sail there, and then Andy looks at the bed, and the whole song is supposed to be, like, Andy putting together the pieces with the other toys, um, 
to turn the bed into a ship so they can go to Mexico through the Panama Canal and end up in LA. And it's like a song for him. I think it's like the only song he has where it's just him singing, which is pretty cool. I like that both him and Anne have a song, but Anne gets a song later on about which is her singing. Okay, and that's the thing. It's my favorite, and it's so catchy. The problem with it is, um, a little bit, a little bit racist in it, like, like, it's a, it's a bop, don't get me wrong, I think you should all listen to it. So, watching it in the musical, it's like, they all, at one point, pull out sombreros and maracas. And it's just like, oh, okay, just, they're doing that, um... Which, which makes me almost a little sad because it's such a good song, but I feel like because of that part, if they ever, like, tried to, like, do the musical again, I'd be worried that they cut the song. The thing is, I feel like it could be an easy fix if they just, like, got rid of that part and kept everything else the same. It would be fine. Because, I mean, it does serve a point in the plot. Like, they're physically, you know, turning the bed into a boat and they're also singing about where they need to go and stuff. So it's not like I feel like they could cut the song completely. And the lyrics are fine, actually. It's just, like, that part they'd have to change. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, they have, um, uh, some bears and maracas. Maracas at one point. Um, and then Raggedy Ann, like, they're getting all these pops from the boat, and Raggedy Ann has this pair of, like, gets this pair of pink sunglasses during the song, which is pretty cool, because she ends up wearing the sunglasses later, and it's just, uh, it's great, and then, like, and, so, yeah, then they make the boat, and now they're sailing on the water, and Raggedy Ann says to Andy, it's like, um, Andy, you're not as dumb as I said you were, and it's just, I love how she'll constantly tease him, because I think that's great, like, he doesn't really have as big of a role as he did, like, in the movie where it looks like both of them were the main character, this musical just mostly focuses on Anne and, like, Anne and Marcella and everyone else is basically, like, a side, all the other toys are basically side characters, but it, like, hush kind of bickers with Andy a little bit. Not like he ever, like, gets mad at her, but she'll, like, kind of tease him a bit. Um, but yeah, that's after he finishes playing the boat together, and now they're in the water, and then... You know, they had picked up the camel, but I don't know anything about him, so they're like, oh, what's your story? Um, and he sings Blue. Um, and Blue's one of the only songs from the movie that got carried over the musical. I think the other one, let me check the list real quick, because I wrote them all out. Um, yeah, the only songs in the movie that they kept here are, uh, Blue and Rag Dolly. And that's actually about it. Everything else is an original song, which is cool, actually. I like that. And I'm glad out of all the musical songs, they did end up picking Blue, because it still works, because no matter what, what you're watching, whether it's the musical or the movie, it's like the Camel's introduction song. Though it does feel a little left field, because, like, it fits in the context of the movie, like how the camel has this whole thing of wanting to try and find a true home and happiness and whatever. But like, he's singing this song about being depressed and how he's blue, but his personality in the musical doesn't really reflect that, and none of those themes from the song ever pop up again. But whatever, it's the camel's introduction song, it's a good song, I don't care. Um, like on one hand, if there was another song I could pick that I wish was in here, that I wish I could hear with, like, these singers. Kind of wish it was Candy Hearts and Paper Flowers. But it doesn't fit the context of the musical at all, because I could see why they didn't pick it. Yeah, Blue Mark's fine. Um, where's my notes? Where's my notes? Uh, I, like, it's a good song and the lyrics are all the same, but I prefer the version from the movie. Because, like, I don't remember who sings it, and then the, he's still, like, the voice actor of the camel, but he has, like, this very strong, like, southern drawl? Southern accent, is that the right word here? I'll go with southern drawl. Um, and then the song also had a banjo, and it has, like, a certain vibe to it and everything. 
and I feel like the way it's sung sounds more sad and makes you feel more sympathetic for the camel. But with this, it's like the singer doesn't sound like that. And I actually noticed they got rid of the banjo entirely and they made it sound more like orchestrated and musical, sound like something in an actual musical. And they also made the song a lot faster too, because like if you listen to the original in the movie and you listen to the one in the musical, it's like the camel in the, orig in the movie would pause during some of the lines, especially during like the first like three or four lines. It's like you kind of draw out the letters more and it would be slower. But they actually sped it up because there's no more pauses between lines at all. Which makes the camel doesn't sound like he's actually supposed to be sad. It just sounds like he's singing a song. Oh, right. I forgot to mention that the camel costume, I think it's pretty cool. Because it's like, it's not like with like how the bat and the wolf look more like people than they do like the animals are supposed to be. No, the camel straight up has like a full on camel costume with a head and everything where he looks like an actual camel. And I really like the head part of the costume because they did this thing with the eyes where the eyes will actually blink sometimes and like they're able to open and close and the mouth, like the mouth is a close but like even though the mouth stays in the same spot but the way the actor who's inside the camel moves around you could still, it's like you could still feel like what the camel's supposed to be emoting. And I thought that's pretty cool. Um, okay, the one thing that I do like that they changed with this song is how towards the end, Raggedy Ann actually starts singing with the camel. And I really like how, like I mentioned, I really like how Ivy Austin's voice sounds in this. So I think it sounds really good when they end up singing, they harmonize and they sing lines together and it sort of, it goes from being the camel song to, towards the end, turning into a duet with Raggedy Ann. And I think that's really sweet, and I like how that sounds. That's like the one good thing I like about this version of the song. Like, it's not a bad song. I still, like, rank it pretty well in my little rankings, but, um, yeah, I prefer the original better. Okay, and since we're at the hour mark here, and I still have another, like, three pages of notes to go with, because we're not even at the halfway point of this musical yet. Um, almost. Not almost at the end of what I'd say is Act 1. Uh, I'm going to end it here, and this is going to be probably like a two-parter or something. So yeah, this is ending my review of the Ragdoll musical. Thanks for watching.